One little point, uh, a word that I correct fairly often is articulatory, right? And one student said articulatory. And I said, that's OK in some versions of British English. I have heard it that way on the BBC, because they actually use that word. But my British teacher is watching our videos. So that means if I ever make a little mistake, my pronunciation's off, I'm going to hear about it, which is good. That's quality control for all of us. He enjoys it. He's teaching English to a friend in Spain. So he says, you know, that's really useful. And he'll be listening carefully. So we all need to be extra careful. And we're getting quality control, like I said. But for the word articulatory, he said he does not say articula uh, articulatory. He doesn't say that. And he didn't believe it was British, but I have heard it. He says articulatory, articulatory. We say articulatory. So how many syllables do I have? Articulatory. I have six. And how many does my British teacher have? Articulatory. He has five. The last one is sort of a, a semi-syllable, Articu articulatory, tree. It's not really tree, it's tree. There's a very short schwa. It's hard to count them. But that's the way he says he says it. Okay. Sometimes <clears throat> native speakers will say, no, no, we don't say that. But I know I've heard it on the BBC, and that's not the only example. Another example is a word. It's called capsicum. Does anybody know what capsicum is? It's tian jiao, like tian hong jiao, qing jiao. Those are, those are tian jiao lei de. Now, I, I see it in cookbooks from the UK, and I've heard it from British speakers, capsicum. But my British teacher said he'd never heard of it. And they use it especially in Australia, but also the UK. So just because we're a native speaker, it doesn't mean that we know everything that native speakers say. We come from a specific region. Our experience is limited. We don't always know everything about our language. I often learn from my students. And there are some things that I hear that my British teacher says he hasn't heard. So just keep that in mind. We need to be realistic about it. We're going to be working on IPA for Chinese very soon. So make sure you've gone over those, especially those two pages of Li Wenjia Lao Shi. Go over them very carefully. It's a lot of material, but those two pages are not a lot. Start playing around with it and see if you can start transcribing some Chinese yourself, just motivated by yourself, into IPA. So when we do it, you'll have some questions ready. We'll certainly run into problems and questions because the system is not precise or clear cut. Anytime we transcribe something, we are making choices. I choose to do things a certain way because, in my perception, they work well, and they reflect what I believe I hear. Other people transcribing Mandarin, for example, will have a different system. It does not mean that anybody is wrong. It means that we either are emphasizing different aspects, either we want a broader transcription or a more narrow transcription, or something that's very much a compromise. Mine is pretty much a compromise, neither very broad nor very narrow. It's somewhere in between, but I think for me it works. So you will certainly have problems. If you play around with it ahead of time, you will have questions ready, and we can get through learning how to write Chinese and IPA faster and more efficiently and more effectively. Did you all hear me? Can you please put that in your notes and your assignments? Play around with it yourself. Try to start transcribing some Chinese words into IPA based on those two pages by Li Wenzhao Lao Shi. Then you will have questions ready, because you might not know how to do everything. Okay, and you're going to be learning the way I do it. It's not the only way, but it's one way, and it's a starting point. If you want to change it later for different purposes, that's fine. Have you all read about taught and taught and caught and caught? Pages 25 and 26 on the website. If you have not, please do it. I know from the test on chapter one, some of you did not do the pinyin tutorial very carefully. It's a very good tutorial. Some of you are my former students, and you've done it once already, and some of you still got some wrong. So I think most of you need to review Han Yu Pinyin. The part of the test where you did the best that I've seen so far is writing down the IPA symbols when I give you the place and manner and state of the vocal fo folds, the place and manner of articulation and state of the vocal folds. Many of you got a perfect score on that, 45%. But on the Pinyin, Many of you made many mistakes. I'll just give an example. Is this correct? 
Alex? <laughs> no, we do not use liang die. U with two, two dots. In, in other words, it's an, a, an umlauted U, U umlaut. We never use it after she. And also, remember I told you in class that the zuin fu hao are really funny on that? They look like xiong, but you don't say xiong, you say xiong. And they break up that diphthong clearly in hanyu pinyin. Remember this. It looks like this in, right? Doing for house of downs. It looks like yu, but we don't use yu. We go to yo. That's an example of the kind of mistakes I found. Another one is gang cai de cai. Is that correct? No. This would be correct in modified Wei Giles, but we're not doing Wei Giles. What should it be? C A I. These are two examples of the mistakes I found. So all of you write it down, review Hai Yu Pinyin. It needs to be perfect, zero mistakes. It's a very mechanical exercise. If you know Zhu Yin Fu Hao and you speak Chinese, Hai Yu Pinyin is a snap, but you have to put in a little time. And be careful, think before you write. Note the exceptions. Is Korean, is the Korean writing system, is it an alphabet or a syllabary? Anybody care to express an opinion? Is there anybody who believes it should be called a syllabary? Raise your hand. Why? Have you studied some Korean? In order to call it a syllabary, it needs to have at least two segments written with one syllable. Do you have that in Korean? Is there any symbol that represents two segments? For example, a diphthong. Well, diphthong is kind of a murky kind of area to talk about. Like, like in Juin Fu Hao, an, that's two different segments in one symbol. So that's like a syllabary. Is there any symbol in Korean that does that? Wendy? Okay, basically, I can tell you that the Korean writing system is an alphabet. It's an alphabet, yeah. It's a very well-designed one overall. It's widely admired in the world. And I think there's, there's, an, there's a Korean alphabet day that linguists kind of note. We don't really celebrate it with a, with a party in costumes. But we do have a day. I forgot what it is, but if you look on the internet, you can find it. When we celebrate, I think it was the promulgation of the Korean alphabet in the 16th century. Okay, so that's one thing that Koreans are dually proud of and the world recognizes. What's left for today is to finish chapter two and go through the performance exercises. So next reader. I think before we start, we better remind everybody where we are. Um, second to last paragraph on page, page 40. 40, good, okay. One of the principal problems in transcribing English phonetically Phonetically, not phonetically. We can get rid of that schwa. Phonetically. Phonetically, phonetically is that there are more vowel sounds than there are vowel letters in the alphabet. Everybody get that? Did that sink in? We don't have that many vowel letters. How many do we have in English? We have five. When we're, kid, when we're kids, we memorize A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. And when my mom was a kid, they said, and sometimes W, because like, Owl, O W. It's sometimes part of a diphthong. So A E I O U Y W, that's a chiga. But how many vowels do we have in English? Let's count them. How many do we have? It depends on the variety of English. And in American, for example, it depends on whether you merge a ah and a ah or not, which I don't. I keep them separate. How many vowels in English? It's just like somebody asking you, how many Juin Fu Hao symbols are there, right? Anybody know how many vowels we have in English? Find it quick. Count them or find it. Let's wait a while, okay? Let's wait till we get it. We're going to keep on talking about vowels. But remember, we have a question to ask. How many vowels are there in English? 
And we also need to know how many consonants there are. OK, continue. In a transcription of the English word C as C, the E represents a similar but not identical sound to that in the Spanish or Italian C. All right, so we're going to have to stop sentence by sentence when there's something important. We transcribe the word C, hi, S-E-A, as S-I. And that works pretty well for speakers of a lot of languages. For, if you, for example, if you speak Spanish or Italian, it looks just like their own spelling. It's not exactly the same, but it's very close. So, si, senor, si, it's very close to the English si. Okay? But unlike Spanish and Italian, English differ differentiates between vowels, such as those in seat, sit, and heed, hid. The vowels in seat, heed, differ from those in sit, hid in two ways. They have a slightly different quality, and they are longer. Did you note that? Usually when we're talking about vowels that contrast in this, in these, in, in this way, how do we describe it? When we're comparing e and i, what, what is it called in the textbooks and in school? One is long and the other is short. Is that the only difference? No. What is another really important difference between the two? Quality and that is a general way of describing how they're different. But if we want to be really concrete, what, what enables us or what causes the difference in sound between those two sounds, e and i? What's different that's causing that difference in sound? Amy? The shape of our mouth. Can you be more precise? The position of the? The position of the tongue, just the median, that. And that's what decides all vowels, basically, is the position of the tongue. Uh, for E, it's the tongue is higher, very front. For I, it's a bit lower and a bit more back, right there. In addition, it's also shorter. So keep those in mind. Long and short are not just long and short. It's not just duration and time. When we hear long and short, a lot of us think about how long it lasts in time. E is long, like C. And then for sit, it's sit. But is S-I-T sit? Sounds like Cantonese. No, it's sit. It's a totally different quality in addition to being shorter. So when you see long and short, remember, it is not just duration. It is also quality. And that is not understood by many, many people who probably have been learning English for many years. Okay. Because the vowels in sit, hid are somewhat, somewhat like those in seat, heed, they are represented by the symbol I, a small capital I. In an earlier edition of this book, the difference in length was also shown by adding the symbol, which, as we will see later, can be used when it is, a necessary, when it is necessary to dis distinguish sounds that differ in length. Adding this symbol to some vowels shows additional phonetic detail, but it goes against the symbol, uh, but it goes against the principle of showing just the differences between phonemes and will not be used when making phonemic, phonemic transcriptions of English in this book. Very good. Let's make sure we understand everything. So, first of all, we call that a length mark, those two little triangles. One is right side up, one is upside down. And we will use those. But do we use them to distinguish different phonemes? Do we use that length mark to distinguish different phonemes? No, we only show additional phonetic detail. It does not change that phoneme into a different phoneme. It simply adds more detail. So for seat, we can put it there. Or maybe we won't put it in seat. But how about seed, Zhongzi? For seed, we can use just a regular dotted I. For seed, we can put that mark in there to show that it's longer because the next sound is voiced. Very good. So seat, we'll use a plain I if we're using, if we're adding more detail. If the next sound is a D, if it's voiced, then we might put that mark in there to remind the reader that because the next sound is voiced, this is longer. Um, but there was somebody who did use the length mark to show different phonemes. Who was it? 
What was his name? Go ahead, Drew. Daniel Jones. Everyone remember Daniel Jones? He's very, very important in the history of phonetics. Daniel Jones, the DJ system. They use the length mark to distinguish E from I. Yeah. Mm. It says here that if we would add it, it would go against the principle of showing just the differences between phonemes. So we'll use a different symbol for a different phoneme. All the other stuff is phonetic detail. We're not going to worry about it right now. Next reader. Uh, the ball in I still haven't heard your name. Oh, <laughs> Yen Chen. Oh, aren't you, don't you want to use your English name? Uh, I prefer to use my okay, Chinese Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And the vowel is... The what? How do we say that? The vowel. Vowels. 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 Ow. Owls. Everybody, vowels. 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 Watch the Z sound of the S. Okay. The vowels in words such as hey, bait, lay are transcribed with a sequence. Transcribed? Transcribed with a sequence of two symbols. Of two symbols? Of two symbols. An E and a short E. Okay. Indicating that for most speakers of English, these words contain a di different diphthong. Diff. Everybody, let's try this. Watch. Take it slowly. Don't jump in right away. Listen to it carefully. Let's use the echo this time. Remember the echo? Diphthong. Diff. Don't jump in after me. Listen to the echo, then repeat. So I'll give you a little signal. Diphthong. Diphthong. Good. And the other thing I noticed was contain, not con, con, con. That's a schwa. Everyone, contain. contain. Go ahead. The first uh, element. Can you try that again? These words. These words. Not these. Brianna Majomo. These words. These words. Yeah. Contain. Con. Contain. Yeah. yeah. A diff. A diff. 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 Song. Diff. Not thong. 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 Uh, diff. Thong. Diff. Thong. Not D. It's diff. One spot. D. D. Thong. You're saying D. We want D. 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 Thong. There you go. That sounds pretty good. The first element in this D. Thong. Diff. Diff. Yeah. Thong. Uh huh. It's similar to sounds in Spanish or Italian. Not Maybe. Spanish. 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 Good. Or Italian. Italian, yeah, no wenti. Nega a is a Spanish Italian. Spanish and or Italian. They use the letter E, such as the Spanish. E, remember continuation rise? Mm. The letter E. The letter E, such as the Spanish word for milk, which is written leche and Pronounced. The second element in pronounced the what? Biakta <laughs> wachu. That's IPA. You can read it. Leche. 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 Uh -huh. The second element in second. The was the second? Second. Uh, the second uh -huh. elements in the English in word. In the English. In the English right. words, hey, bait, lay is e. 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 The symbol used. For transcribing, transcribing? The transcribing the vowel in hid. 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 Okay, you need to watch out for vowels. So, i, don't read i, I as e, and don't read um, a as a. Gang Spanish Italian. Uh, you guys are Spanish and Italian. This, the, this is important. This will probably also be in the test, so pay attention. We don't have a monophthong a in English. We only have the diphthong a. Although some people make it sound like a monophthong, I told you before. That's why KK uses only one symbol. But I say a. For example, lay. Late. Laid. You can hear very clearly that it's an a. It's a diphthong. We write it like this. Latifoget says that this is. We use this symbol i. But it's not really an i, and it's not quite an e. It's somewhere in between it and e. 
Listen to the way I say it. It's almost like in Mandarin, so you can do it yourself. Lei, lei. Now it's not lei, uh, it's not i, uh, it's not so low. And it's not lei, it's not so high. But for me, it's closer to i. It's somewhere in between those two. And we mentioned before that the elements in a diphthong almost never exist what? This sound and this sound, the way we say it in the diphthong, do not exist what? As a Dainyuan in monophthong in English. We do not have an A in English at all. And this I is not really an I, it's closer to E. So whatever the elements are in a diphthong, normally we don't have either one. Exact, that's exactly the same as a monophthong. And I mentioned it before, that's why we write I like this, and we don't write it with this kind of an A. This is Ega. We don't write that. We write this. Because it's not I, it's I. Uh, let's practice the Spanish word for milk because that one is a monophthong. It sounds like English A, but it's not a diphthong. It's just a pure monophthong A. Everybody, leche. 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 Not leche. That's a real American sound. <laughs> leche. It's leche. leche. Good. It'll probably be in the test. So make sure you know that Spanish word and you know that that's a monophthong. It's not a diphthong. And that's where Americans very often make pronunciation mistakes in any language they learn. They like to turn every vowel into a day. We love to diphthongize vowels. We bring that over from our native language. So leche is the way many Americans would say it. Probably Brits as well. But leche, leche. All right, next. My name is Alice. Two symbols that are not, uh, that are not ordinary letters of the alphabet, a and a, are used for the vowels in head and head, respectively. The first is based on the Greek letter epsilon and the Epsilon? Epsilon. Not long. Lan. Lan. No, no. La, un, un, de, un, lan. Lan. Epsilon. Epsilon. That's an American pronunciation. Epsilon. Uh -huh. And the second. Say on, it again. Okay. On the Greek letter. On the Greek letter, epsilon. Lan. Long. No. You're having trouble. You're putting a velar there. You're saying long. E epsilon. You're saying un dian. You're saying ang zang da ang, but we want un dian da un. Epsilon. Un. Epsilon. Louder? Epsilon. It's not O, oh, it's A. Ah. Number one, Mu Yin Sa A. Dear Gus, An Dian An. 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 Once more? An. You just say Jen Yima Ding Da. An. Yo Meo. An. Okay, now it sounds right. Gang Gang Jo Meo. How? Epsilon. Lan. Lan. Okay. You need to practice that. Mark that. You need to practice. Even if you get it right, it's not very natural yet. Go ahead. And the second on the letters. A. An, not on, an. The second on. No. A, an. One chen yang de wen ti, one chen yi mo yang de wen ti. An. An. An the letters. On the letters. Not on. An. An. Yeah. The letters A and E joined together. They may be referred to, the, uh, to by the names epsilon and ash. Okay. Sometimes I've called it digraph, but uh, here they call it epsilon and ash. So, Tao San, we use the Greek letter name epsilon. Everyone, epsilon. Epsilon. All right, and that hu dia a, the butterfly a in English, it's even easier than Chinese. Ash. Ash. Hui, hui jin, the hui, ash. Okay. Next. Wen Wendy. Most Americans use the name the same vowel sound in the word words heart and hot and can use the, use one form of the letter A. They would transcribe these words as heart. Uh -huh. Transcribe what? These yes. these words as as heart and hot. All right, note that because a lot of you are confused by O in spelling. H O T in American is the A sound. Somebody once said you don't have many words with the A ah sound in English, in American English, do you? I said, we have lots of them, like hot, pot, 
All the words that rhyme with it, spot, rot. 那个 o 后面没有 e， 很多都念 ot。But this sound is kind of unstable because some of, some people will say, for example, hot, in America as well, and it's hot in British, a totally different vowel. But in American, father, hot, they have the same vowel, ah. And it says that we could use the same vowel for both heart and hot. Those are the ah. With the r, it changes a little, but close enough. Go on. But some East Coast Americans and speakers of British English who did not pronounce R sounds, r sounds after a vowel, distinguish between these words by the qualities. Distinguish between these words. These 不要重 Almost all of you stress the word these, and you should not, usually. Okay, so transcribe these words as, and here it's a different one. Between, uh, distinguish between these words by. Distinguish between these words by the qualities of the vowels, and have to use two different forms of the letter A. Uh, letter A. Yeah.、Mm -hmm. They would transcribe these words as hot and hot. Hot. There we go. That upside down A without a cap on it. That's a British sound. We don't have an American, though some people on the east coast of the U.S. do have something like it. It's all. And it's not the kai ko o. So, for example, the word yuan tao is sauce. Sauce. It also is the word for jiang liao, sauce. That's o, pork, etc. But this is hot. 嘴巴比较开一点，没有那么圆，然后舌头比较低，蛮后面也比较低。Everybody hot. 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 That's the upside down a in British. Normally, at least in my English, I don't have it. Some East Coasters may have it. Everyone clear on that now? You're going to need that symbol for British English, and this is where the vowel systems of British and American get quite confusing. Now, my British teacher told me that I had them straight, straighter than he had. I think it's just because I've heard British so much that I, an echo tells me that that's the way it is in British. But there are many sounds we don't distinguish in English, in American English, that they do distinguish in British, British English with this vowel. So be aware of that.、Mm. Okay, I'm going to read, summarize part of it myself now to kind of hurry us through. Most speakers of British and many Americans distinguish between cot, caught, not, not. N O T is not everybody. A lot of you say funny, other funny pronunciations. But in my dialect, everyone, not, not. Ah. ah. A lot of you say not. Is that right? Something like that. That's British. Something like British. It's not caught, caught, not.、Um, we use the open o for this sound for ah in American. In British, American caught, caught. In British, it's caught, caught. Court and it sounds like court, 朝廷，对。So 那是 o 嘴巴是比较小一点，比较圆一点，舌头比较高。Um, many Midwestern and Far Western American speakers do not need to use this symbol because they have those two sounds have ah and ah have what in the U.S. Midwest and West. For many people, they have merged. 合并了，已经变成一个音了。本来是啊啊，两个音。现在对很多人来说，只有一个音，合并了。So they don't need the symbol a. 那个开口 o 根本用不上。And then we have another special symbol, and this is one I want to mention because I saw it in your test. When you are writing the short u, don't write this. Everybody see that? Do not write this. What is missing? The little bars at the top. Everybody, write this. Do not write this. 这一次没有算错，下一次开始这个会算错。Okay, even if you can say that somebody else does this or blah blah blah, I am asking you to do it this way, so it's perfectly clear. Write the u sound this way, not this way. Everyone clear? Okay. How? I noticed that in the test for some of you anyway. Then there's a vowel that we're going to talk now about the vowel in ho. Do code in American English, it's close to o, but it is a diphthong. It's not just o; 
If, if it were a monophthong, it would sound funny to my ears. Ho, do, cold. Sounds really weird. In some dialects, it is a monophthong. In Hawaii, some people, some speakers in Hawaii make it a monophthong. For me, it is a diphthong, like ojo, the o, just like Mandarin, but longer. So, ho, everyone, ho, ho. do, do. Cold. cold. Watch this because in Taiwan English, very often you make it into a monophthong. Ho, uh, do, cold. I hear that a lot in Taiwan English. Um, all right, in Southern British, Standard British English, they have more of an O sound to it. So it's ho, do, code, code. You want to try it? Mine is not perfect, but you'll get the idea. So ho, do, do, do ko. ko. When I say it, my British teacher says I overdo it. Just so you know. Uh, we already know what a schwa is. We'll talk about it later. And the final element of the diphthong in words such as ho and code is close to u, but not exactly u. An upside down letter v is used for the vowel in words like bud and hut. We often call it wedge. Wedge is called in Chinese xie zi, but some people call it xie zi. Zi dian yin xie zi. But it's, a lot of people say xie zi. It means wedge. 一个三角形的东西 可以用来 that's a wedge. And this sound is very different in British English from American, as I've told you before. In American, it's close to a schwa. So, for example, we have um, bud. Everyone, bud? bud. Hut. Hut. In British, it's closer to a. Ah. So, bud, bud. hut. Ah. All right. Then we have a three. It's a reversed epsilon, but we don't need to say reversed epsilon in Chinese. Because epsilon is already dao san, so it becomes a dao dao san. That just means it's dao san. Is that right? You don't think that's funny? I thought it was a little funny. <laughs> All right, it's just like a san, a san, a san. We use that in British only, not in American. Without the R, we use it only in British for these words like this. Everybody, pert pert means very energetic. 很干脆又很精力充沛, that's pert. Everyone, pert. Bird. 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 Kurt. Kurt. Kurt means very short and not very polite. He was very curt with me. So, meet me at 5 o'clock, and then he ran away. He was very curt. All right. And then it's similar to, to the word for short in French and Spanish, if you know what those are. Um, we, we can use the symbol, and this is the way KK does it. We can put a little hook on it to make, a, make it a rhotic sound, so it becomes er. So if an er sound is stressed in KK, and we're going to follow that, we're going to write it like this. That's the difference. If it is stressed, like in bird, curt, uh, what was the other one? Bird, Kurt, Pert. We'll use this one. Three with a hook. If it's unstressed like teacher, writer, we'll use this one. I heard something very funny today on the radio. When it said er is in Chinese what? E-R is a good right? Like du is reader. Is that right? Someone on the radio this morning said Promote,提倡的人，推就是行销的人，promote。我愣了一下，他那个code listen to Fadi in the morning. I get lots of really good examples. 我有一堆那个台式英语, that I'll share with you on another time. Um, Okay, so this little hook here, here I make a little, it looks like a sideways V, but it's called R coloring. R coloring. R hua yun in Chinese. R hua yun. Rhoticization, you can call it rhoticization or R coloring. R hua yun. All three mean the same thing. All right, for I, the first element in I, this vowel. It says that it's close 
to the vowel in cat or somewhere between the vowel in cat and the vowel in hard. Pass a cat, this moin is hard, hard. This moin is a moin. That's why we use a different symbol. So it is not a, a, it's somewhere in between. We have a separate symbol. And same for ao. It's similar, but also the a in ao is not exactly as the same as the a in ai. In every diphthong, all of the sounds get a little changed because they're influenced by the other vowel. Did everybody catch that? So the a is going to be influenced by the e or the is sound in ai, and it's going to be influenced by the u sound in ao. Okay, and the second part of ao is also not exactly u, it's just sort of close. And then we have oi, kaiko o plus i. For me, it's more to towards e, boy. Tasa man de, boy, boy. But not completely. I don't say boy. Meo na mangao. So again, we've got these ai mei sounds that are neither, fish, neither flesh nor fowl. Uh, neither flesh nor fowl. Ta ye busa zega i, ye busa nega i. It's something else. Similar, but not the same. Remember, in Taiwan English, you often make which sound too long in this diphthong? In the word boy, that diphthong, which, which of the two parts of the diphthong usually gets too long in Taiwan English? The all part. Don't say boy. That's a little more British, but not quite. In American, it's quite short. Everyone, boy. Poison. Toy. OK, good enough. We're on page 42. We've already been over this. The remaining words in Table 2.2, let's just flip back very quickly. We've got special diphthongs in British because they have dropped the R. In American, we have the R. It's not pronounced in British. It's been replaced by a schwa. This will also probably be in the test, so make sure you're paying attention to this. And one thing that people get wrong almost every year, I will tell you now, so please don't make this mistake in the test. They will say that. For example, in the word car, Brits don't pronounce the R. Therefore, we get a schwa. Is that correct? How do we say this word in, it, in American? Car. How do we say it in British? Ka. Ka. All right, do you hear a schwa? I don't hear one. <laughs> so everyone always picks this example, too. Probably 十几年,每一次都有人选car这个字,做例子,说英式 is it true in all cases? Now you know that in this case, is, in this case it is definitely not true. Car has no schwa diphthong, no, does not become a diphthong, let's put it that way. The vowel does not become a diphthong, there is no schwa. It is simply ka, it's a very long a, a sound. Okay, got that? Don't put that in your test, please. So we have a number of extra diphthongs in British because they've dropped the R. And what are they? Let's go to the list. We went over them before. Let's do it again. Bottom of 39. For American ear, we get what in British? Ear, here, here. And for air, hair, tofa, we get? Hair, air. And then for higher, guyong, we get higher in American and in British? Higher. It could be higher. You can do it carefully and slowly. But if you do it fast, it comes out ha, ha, okay. And I have to mention one other thing. Say this in American. Yeah. Say it in British. Yeah. It's not here is unless you separate them with a big pause. You know that in when I'm telling you things about pronunciation, I often tell you to link muin kaito de zi, chen yi ge zi, zui hou yi ge yin, yao lian dao xia yi ge zi, zuo wei ta di yi ge yin, is that right? That's the linking rule. So in American, we say, and in British, we say, here is. Here is, do you hear the R? But British is not supposed to be a rhotic dialect. Now, ta zi me bian sheng rhotic, ta zi me bian sheng yu er hua yun ne. Jerome? Exactly. Everybody note this rule. This is important. Please, I know the bell is rung, but put it in your notes. If the final sound of a syllable is R and the beginning sound of the next syllable is a vowel, 
Brits will pronounce the R normally. So here is becomes here is in British. If it begins with a vowel, they will put the R in. That's called a linking R. We can call this a linking R. Well, why don't I take this off so I can use the quotes here? That's better. It's called a linking R. And I want to tell you one more thing before we break, because it's not only here that we're going to find it. Here's a famous phrase that I'll use as an example. Let's get the car out of the way. I know the Japanese make great cars, but we've got to get it out of the way. Say it in American. China and Japan. China and Japan. Say it in British. Can somebody volunteer so I can hear one voice? Somebody brave? Jerome, you want to do it? You could do it that way, but normally they say, listen carefully, China and Japan. China and Japan. No, but Brits often have it. And not only that, they deny that they have it. That's the funny part. China in Japan. China in Japan. Try it. Even with names, for example, um, President Ma, right? Ma Zhongtong. I hear on the radio, they say, Ma is going to appear at a, a conference. President Ma is going to listen to ICRT. You will hear it all the time. That's the way Gavin Phipps says it. Hi, Gavin. Okay. Um, so when we have, in some cases, not all vowels, usually it's a schwa. Usually it's a schwa. But there are other vowels where it might happen. When we link to another word starting with a, uh, to the next word that starts with a vowel, to another word that starts with a vowel, we have, you can call it a linking R, but there was not an R there in the first place. We call this an intrusive R. And remember that I told you that a lot of allophonic differences that we have in a language, the speakers don't notice them at all. Like in Chinese, I told you, at least everybody I've asked told me, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you're right. Most Brits do not notice they are doing this. And that's why they will deny it later. And they will criticize other people when they hear it. I have many stories like this, but you get the idea. Um, I have an experience with that that I thought was kind of interesting. I was recording once. It was an English child's high for children. And they got an Australian to record with me, an Australian speaking American. But this guy is Li Hai Dao Ji Dian. When he was talking to me, just chatting, he was speaking Australian English. When we recorded, it was perfect American. <laughs> No, no shots at all. Have you ever listened to Russell Crowe, the actor? He's also perfect. His, his American is perfect. He didn't shots at all. He's really, really good. Maybe not a nice person, but he's really good with his accent. Um, yeah, I heard that he hits people and things. Um, but, okay, he was recording in this absolutely perfect English. But then there was one sentence. He said, there's an umbrella in the trunk. There's an umbrella in the trunk. Trunk is 车子的那个行李箱. He said, there's an umbrella in the trunk. What was, what was in the trunk? Umbrella. What did he have? He had an intrusive R. And so he just said it, and I stopped the recording. I said, you have an intrusive R. And he said, I have a what? <laughs> and he said it again. I said, there's your R. He did not notice it at all. And his, his American was absolutely flawless, absolutely perfect. But this was under his radar. Somebody who is so good, he missed that. So that tells you, when we're talking about allophones, native speakers very, very often have no awareness of them whatsoever. Okay, everybody got that? What? That's the only one. 
That was the only one. Because we were recording, they wanted it in an American accent. 那个也是失德啊，刚好就是我那篇文章不是放失德，那个也是失德的。When he was recording, it was there was no mistake at all. Perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And suddenly there was an umbrella in the trunk. <laughs> 一定会跳一下，很奇怪。So yeah, 我没有一直挑他的毛病 That was the only one. Okay? Yeah, the only one. Anybody else have a comment or question or 怀疑什么事情？ <laughs> That's it. We're going to take a short break. <clears throat> a question that came up during the break. Karen asked if the R here was a kind of assimilation. I wouldn't call it assimilation. It definitely is a kind of linking, because here is in British here is. If we don't link it with the R, what sound do we have between these words? We have a glottal stop there. You can avoid it, but it takes effort. Here is. It's almost impossible to get rid of that glottal stop if you don't have some kind of a linking sound. And how do Brits feel about glottal stops like that? Remember when we were talking about butter, some bread and butter, butter, nayo, butter, butter. What did we say about that in Cockney? What do other Brits feel about that? How do they feel about it? It sounds very low class, working class. A big insult in, Brit in British is British thinking, not just English, is working class. So if it's working class, we don't consider it educated. They don't like glottal stops, although they use a lot of them. If it's obvious, uh, obvious if it sticks out, they don't like it because it suggests working class English. So they keep the R in there. I can't say that that's the reason, but that's one reason behind it. And what is the rule? I don't know the exact rule, but I know that it depends on the final vowel here. Some final vowels don't take intrusive R, but a schwa will. In China, 它最后一个音是不是一个 schwa? China, China, China in Japan. So with a schwa plus a word that starts with a vowel, you get an intrusive R. Not a, not all the time, but it's very common. Okay. I think that was it. And then back to this. This is not a very consistent feature of KK. I felt that when I first learned it. Why should we use one symbol when the vowel is stressed and another when it's unstressed? Because we don't do that for any other vowel. We don't have a separate symbol for stressed ah and unstressed ah. We only do it for this sound. This sound. Well, first of all, I believe the reason we do it is so that we can keep the correspondence between an American and British English. A little closer, we can. It's a little more convenient. It's a little more transparent this way. Bird, bird. 那个符号很像，这是英文，呃，美式英文会加一个 r 而已，对不对？那这个 r 为什么不能放在那个有重音的音节？那这是自己设的一个规则，有一点 arbitrary。这个有一点 arbitrary。It's in KK. You can choose not to. 你可以决定，没事，不要用那个，全部用这个。你先立下这个这个规定就可以了。Any other questions before we continue? If it's not clear, if there's something that doesn't seem to make sense, if I've made a mistake, please tell me. Uh, I told that to my freshman English students this morning. I said, if I make a mistake, please tell me. He said, really? <laughs> of course. If you don't like interrupting in class, then come talk to me during break or put it in your notes or do something, but please do tell me. We all make mistakes. Remember, there is no learning without mistakes, and that applies to teachers like anybody else. So what I've learned is mainly from students' mistakes that I've observed, but you've certainly observed mistakes in me that have also helped me learn. Okay, we're in the middle of the paragraph at the top of 42, and we we're talking about the end of the diphthong in these special diphthongs for British English, like here, ha, ha, and it says some usually old-fashioned British English speakers also use a diphthong in words like. All right, in American, you can say poor, cure. But instead of poor, a lot of people say poor. He's really poor. You'll hear it. It's really, really common in American. Poor. He's really poor. If we're more formal, it's poor. Now, in British English, how do we say these words? Usually, they say poor, cure. Poor, cure. But it says, if you're old-fashioned, you might say poor, cure. Or cure, oh yeah, cure probably sounds a lot like poor. I know that poor is pronounced um, pull. He's very pull. And cure probably also 比较没有那么明显的一个
、呃、diphthong 的那个 off glide， 呃，对，没有那么明显的刷的那个 off glide。OK。Um, but if you're old-fashioned or speaking very formally, it would be poor, cure. And then in words like fire, higher, you can say, and I said this earlier, fire, higher, fire, higher. But in colloquial British, you'll probably say fire, higher. So, same wing and strong wing the tabie, and it's in your book. You should be able to get it.、Um, Everything in 2.2 it says all the words are monosyllables except for ahoy, and ahoy is a greeting used on ships. At least it was in the past. So none of them contains both stressed and unstressed vowels. The most common unstressed vowel in English is the schwa, and not only that, it's not only the most common unstressed vowel. It is also the most common vowel in terms of frequency. 出现率最高的一个母音就是刷，好像是百分之三十左右。I've seen the number recently. I don't remember it exactly. You can check on the internet. But I think it's something like thirty percent or more of all English vowels. 出现就是每一次出现来算，刷是最长，听到的最多，频率最高的。It comes from Hebrew, because in Hebrew, I believe they have three kinds of reduced vowels, short reduced vowels. 希伯来语有三种类型的很短的刷，三种类型。The word 刷 comes from Hebrew. 那是其中之一叫做刷。经过德文 that's why we've got the S C H spelling. 那是德文的舌的拼法是 S C H. So we got it from Hebrew through German, and it's called a schwa, an unstressed vowel, and reduced. And it occurs at the ends of words like sofa, soda. Now, all of us are influenced by spelling. I said before that in second grade, I didn't believe there was really a schwa. I thought it was soda, sofa. 我就不愿意承认那个是一个 schwa. Just like Alex didn't want to believe that an is not a diphthong. 他就是不愿意相信。我小时候也不愿意相信有 schwa 这回事。写的是 a， 念的应该是 a. But that's a schwa. You can hear it in the middles of words like emphasis, and emphasis. 后面那个 sus 对我来说，在我的发音里也是一个 uh. Everybody emphasis. Emphasis is okay for me. Emphasis 也可以 I think I use both. Demonstrate. Demonstrate. Everyone. Demonstrate. Good. It can be at the beginning of a word like around. Everyone. Around. Arise. Uh, and we use the stress mark symbol that they show in the book. You already know that from KK. In British English, it's usually the sole component of ER in words like brother, brotherhood, simpler, which in British are brother, brotherhood, simpler. simpler. Right. I can hear my American accent, but never mind. In forms of American English with R colored vowels, remember R coloring, R colored vowels are 花韵的。而或者儿化母音的，儿化元音也可以这么说。We have brother, brotherhood, simpler. As with the symbol er, that's the stressed version. Your 重音记的是 three plus the hook. A small hook symbolizes our coloring on the schwa symbol. And both schwa and the rhoticized schwa are very, very common vowels. And a、uh、occurs very frequently in unstressed monosyllables. In when we are talking about shuitsu, so in shuitsu we often have a schwa rather than a full vowel. For example,、um, I'm going to the library. I'm going. I don't. I didn't say to. I said I'm going to the library. I'm going to to. We are practicing that in freshman English this morning. You really need to learn the schwa pronunciation of function words because. If you don't pronounce them with a schwa, what will happen? The sky will not fall. Okay, the sky will not fall. But what happens if you don't pronounce the vowel in in function words as a schwa? I'm going to the library. The way my students say it sounds something like usually something like, I I am going to the library. I am going to the library. But what I say is, I'm going to the library. I'm going to the library. Now, if you use my rhythm with Taiwan pronunciation, what happens? 
I will use my pronunciation, you use Taiwan pronunciation. Let's see what happens. Start with, I'm going to the library. Go. I'm going to the library. Who finished first? <laughs> Do you see that you have a lot of extra syllables at the end after I'm already finished? Well, you think, no, this is quite, quite man the wound. This is quite man. The thing is that in English, although some textbooks tell you it's just a myth, it is true. We have stress timing. The timing of our language is determined by the stress of this word to the stress of the next word and so on. So from one stress to the next stress to the next stress, 中间的那个间隔差不多长. Not exactly, but we like to keep the spaces between stresses somewhat even. So I'm going to the library. I'm going to the library. It slows the whole thing down. So if you're not putting schwa's in function words, and when the, the jiezo is wrong, it's sort of like getting the wrong tone in Chinese. It confuses us a little bit. Because we're, it's not important. We're not expecting something not important to get so much stress or to be a very clear vowel. Does everybody get it? As I told my freshman English students this morning, if you get it, could you please nod your head? <laughs> yeah, you understand what I said. So you need to start paying attention to function words in English very often. Probably most of the time we need a schwa and not a full vowel. So t instead of two. Okay? Next, we've got here. He gave you other examples here. A, uh, a book. If you have a foreigner or an English native speaker who doesn't have experience teaching, they might say a book. But it should be a book. Short, and it's a schwa. T, we mentioned, but, B-U-T, but. Instead of saying but, unless we're still thinking, I'd like to, I'd like to go, but I can't. I'd like to go, but I, but I, but I, it's not, but I can't, it's, but I can't. And the qing tai zhu don't say can. We don't usually say can unless we're stressing it. So, uh, I can do it is Taiwan English, but I can do it. I can do it. And I think I've told you, we can reduce it all the way to just basically a glottal stop. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Okay, it's a nasalized glottal stop. All right. So start paying attention to that because it will help you get a rhythm that's closer to uh, a native speaker's rhythm. Um, it says some of the other vowels also occur in unstressed syllables, but because of differences in accents of English, it's more difficult to say which vowel occurs in which word. For example, nearly all speakers of English differentiate between the last vowels in Sophie, sofa, pity, patter. Well, it would be pata in British, pity, pata. Um, but some accents have the vowel e, as in heed, at the end of Sophie, pity. In, in, in KK, for a final Y in spelling, you learn to use which vowel symbol? You use I. No, like pity, pity. You will write it like this. But from now on, we're going to write it like E. So don't use this one for a final Y in spelling. It's possible, and in conservative British, pity. It's possible, but... Um, we're just going to use E. And it says, others have it as in hid, sofa, pity. Uh huh. And then, most accents take the vowel in the second syllable of taxis, uh, make it, sorry, make it different from that in Texas. They are extremely different for me. Everybody, Hanwei Ji Taxis. Taxis. Okay, Dojo, Texas. Texas. What vowel do I have in the second syllable of Texas? It's a schwa, definitely a schwa. And this is a little bit ty hua, but we're talking about megua di ming and about British pronunciation. Let me get rid of some of this. I can think of two place names that are different in British, and they kind of, they used to make me laugh, but now I'm used to it. All right. This is in Texas, since we're talking about Texas, maybe that's why I thought of it. How do we say it? Houston. Very good. That's American Houston. Hugh. Uh-huh. And this one? Very American. Very good. Los Angeles. In British, many say Houston. 
and Los Angeles. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Don't laugh too hard. My teacher's watching. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Los Angeles. <laughs> so you'll hear those different. And it's my country. So, but then we pronounce their place names very funny too. Right? Like um, Texas. And the letter X. In spelling, we write an X, but how would we write it in KK or in the IPA? K S. Don't just say the sound. I know it's K already. I need to know how to write it. So it's K S. It's two separate consonants, two separate sounds. Although it often gets simplified into S in Taiwan English. So exercise. Some people say exercise instead of exercise. Watch that. Mm. Okay, you should start doing some transcription exercises. Not now. Next is consonant and vowel charts. So far we've been using the consonant and vowel symbols mainly as ways of representing the contrast that occur among words in English because we are looking for how many what English has. Vowels and consonants, but that's not the word I'm after right now. The ones that represent contrasts that give us different words with different meanings. We want to know how many phonemes English has. That's what we're working on. Because this unit, after all, is about, go back to the title. Remember I told you that titles are very important? Phonology. And in phonology, we want to know, first of all, how many phonemes are they and what are, are there and what are they? So keep that in mind. We wanted to look for sounds that contrast with each other, that will produce words that mean different things, different words entirely. We can also think of these symbols in a different way. And this, this idea takes a little We can view these symbols as shorthand descriptions of the articulations involved. We're so used to, at least in Taiwan most of you, are so used to the KK symbols, it's hard to think about them philosophically or analytically because you're so used to them. But instead of just viewing them as symbols that represent contrast, contrasting sounds in English, we can think of them as shorthand for descriptions of articulations like we had in the test. For example, P can be an abbreviation for number one, state of the vocal folds, voiceless, right? Do you see what we're doing here? Next, place of articulation, bilabial, and third, manner of articulation. So do you see? P, actually, we can think of as how many pieces of information? Three pieces of information. P, bytes of information into one symbol. We can view the IPA symbols in this way. Everybody got that? It's a subtle difference. bytes of information. Okay? For L, uh, for L, what do we have? State of the vocal folds? Good. And place of articulation? Stop there, right? And then manner of articulation? Lateral approximant. Uh, we can arrange them in a very organized way on a chart. And you need to be able to reproduce this chart because you probably have to do it for the test. So memorize the chart. Be able to write it exactly like you see it on page 43 for the consonants. And we'll have the vowels after that. Um, so why did we not put the affricate symbols there? They are contrastive in English. They are phonemes in English. You need to keep that in mind. Ch and j are phonemes. But we didn't put them on the chart, because what kind of a chart is it? Look at the caption for the chart, or the title, where it says figure 2.1, the second word. It's phonetic. Therefore, why didn't we put ch and j in there? Because, because ch and j are what kinds of symbols? They're composite, right? So you could say compound symbols. They have two parts to them, the stop and the, and the fricative. So we can just put two of these sounds together to produce ch and j by rule. We don't need to actually put them in the chart. And it was not done here. And it says, note that if we were to include them, we would have the problem of deciding 
whether to put them in the palatoalveolar column, the place of the fricative element, or in the alveolar column. Because T is an alveolar and SH is, place of articulation is for SH, palatoalveolar. So, Dadi Yao Fang Zai alveolar nani has a palatoalveolar. Yao Wu de Hua, I would put it under palatoalveolar. Yin Wei Chi Sinega Ti the Wei Zhe Hui Bei Ta Ying Xiang. So, CH, I have no problem with putting it under palatoalveolar. Uh, he says it's a problem, but I don't think it's a problem. And so we avoid that problem completely by listing only stops and fricatives, no affricates. So look at that chart carefully, but spend more time on your own. This is not going to be enough for you. You'll notice something funny about the symbol for uh, the wuh sound. What do you notice about it? Hmm? It's bilabial and? And velar both. So it appears how many times on the chart? Two. And the first time, further to the left, it appears in what form? Typographically, in what form? How did they present it? In parentheses. They don't want you to think it's a different W. It's the same W, but it has two places of articulation. Another thing you need to know for the test. W has two places of articulation. What are they? Bilabial and velar. Okay? Bilabial, we have a lot of lip rounding with w. We are on the next page, and we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Next figure, we have a vowel chart. This is the vowel space. You can call it a vowel chart. We often call it the vowel space. And that's the shape of it. You also need to memorize this and be able to put all of the vowels for American English in the right place. I won't test you, especially on British English right now maybe in the future, but you need to know where the vowels go approximately for American English. So memorize these two charts, practice drawing them, because when you write them, you've got muscle memory, it will help you remember them better in addition to um, the visual image. Um, so the symbols we've been using for the contrasting vowels can, in the same way as we did with consonants, be used as a kind or viewed as a kind of shorthand descriptions of different vowel qualities. Um, we have problems because we've been using the symbols pretty loosely. They have different values for different accents. For example, wedge, right? It's in American, it's what? Upside down V? In American, it sounds like what? Dao V is a manian. Uh. And in British? Ah, it's more like ah, cup. All right. Um, but we are just going to use this as sort of a, a generalized representation of English vowels. Mm. They've been placed within a quadrilateral, which is a sibianxing, not a square. They're not equal lengths, the, the sides. And the rest you know, e for a high vowel, i for uh, mid-high, etc. Mm. We have only two dimensions of vowel quality. What is missing when we have only two dimensions for vowel quality? Which feature, which is very important, is missing? Amy? There's a third feature that we need to describe vowels. Jamie? Someone else had it. A guy. Spit. Yeah, stop, stop, you got it. <laughs> Not or, it's rounding. We don't have rounding marked in this chart. So with only two, with only two dimensions, we're missing a very important piece of information. Is it spread lips or rounded? Rounded the xiang fan is spread, S-P-R-E-A-D, spread. In, Chin excuse me? in Chinese, it's zhan chun. Fa zhan de zhan, zhan chun, zui chun de chun, zhan chun. So is it rounded or spread? or maybe neutrals. For some of them, it, you don't really have spread lips or rounded lips, it's neutral. That's another description we could use. Okay, actually, um, Stanley, did you have something in mind besides rounding? Uh, you said it could be rounding or, and then I cut you off. What else did you have in mind? Uh, rounding and unrounding. Oh, and unrounding, okay. Yeah. That's the same thing then. 
That's the same thing. But there is another thing he mentions here, second paragraph, page 44. It also does not show length. 长度也没有标出来. So those are two important pieces of information that we do not see on the chart. Number one, rounding. Number two, length. And the vowel and consonant charts enable us to understand the remark made in chapter one when we said that the sounds of English involve about how many different gestures of the tongue and lips? Last paragraph on 44. How many different gestures do we count of the tongue and lips for the sounds of English? 25. And the consonant chart has 23 of these. But only 11 basic gestures of the tongue and lips are needed to make these different sounds. So we have many different kinds of gestures, but we really only need 11 to make the different sounds. For example, p, b, m are all made with the same lip gesture. D, a t, d, n, all with the same tongue gesture, as are k, g, n, all the same tongue gesture, back of the tongue touching the soft palate. There are some slight differences, but we'll just ignore those for now, it says. For mo uh, four more gestures are required for the sounds in the fricative row. You need to pay attention to this part, because in the exercises, they're going to ask you questions about how many gestures. Okay? So here's where you'll find the answer. Mark this answer to one of the questions in the exercises. Four more gestures are required for sounds in the fricative row. Let's look at the fricative row. Third row on page 43, f, v, f, v, dang, dang. To make all those gestures, all the gestures for the fricative sounds, we need three, uh, we need four more. And then three more for the approximants, for the y and the w. And then another one for the lateral approximant, making 11 in all. I'm not going to go over it in further detail. Figure it out yourself. You need it for the exercises. All right. The vowel chart has how many symbols? Now, remember the question we asked earlier? How many vowels do we have in English? That's the answer. How many? We have 14. We have 14. And there's a different gesture for each vowel. So 14 vowels, 14 gestures. So we consider each one to have a separate gesture. But as we have seen, accents of English vary. So how many, um, how many gestures would be needed for a variety of English that merges a and a? Go ahead, Jerome. 13. That was a toughie. OK. Mm. So we say about 25 different gestures of the tongue and lips. Uh, for the sounds of English. So, this And all of these sounds also require gestures of the other three main components of the speech mechanism. Remember? Speech mechanism. Not mechanism, mechanism. Some of you will still get it wrong, I bet. Everyone, speech mechanism. Speech mechanism. All right, repeat after me so we practice. The airstream process. The airstream process. Okay, and what does that mean? The air coming up from our lungs, right? The phonation process. Go. The phonation process. That means voicing or not. And then the oro nasal process. Oro nasal process. If it's an oral sound or a nasal sound. The airstream process involves pushing air out of the lungs for all the sounds of English. So the airstream, pro airstream process is needed for all the sounds of English. That's our power source. Phonation is responsible for gestures of the vocal folds, voiced versus voiceless sounds. An oronasal process concerns whether the velum is raised or lowered to distinguish oral from nasal sounds. All right, we're in phonology now, just about to finish up. Um, it says at the beginning of the chapter, we discussed another reason why it is only approximately true that in our transcriptions of English, the symbols have the values shown in figures 2.1 1, and 2.2. In the style of transcription we have been using so far, we have used symbols that show just the contrasting sounds of English, the phonemes. So for phonemes, we don't want to pay attention to phonetic detail. 
We only want to know if this sound is a, a contrast with another sound. If I use bat, is it a different word from pat? Yes, it is. Those are different phonemes. That's what we're concerned about so far. But now, uh, from this point on, we'll use slash marks if we are talking about phonemes. If it's phonemic, a phonemic, that's the adjective. If it's a phonemic transcription, then we use slashes. We use slash marks. And please tell all your friends this, because most people don't seem to know it in Taiwan. Teachers don't know it. They don't explain it in English class. And we'll use brackets when we're doing a phonetic transcription. The actual sound, if we're representing the actual sound, we use brackets. Um, some sounds will have different values in different contexts. For example, T has many different um, realizations, xian realizations. In tap, what is it? We're in the second paragraph under phonology on 45. In tap, how, does, uh, how can we describe t? It's a disanhang, a voiceless alveolar stop. But in eighth or eighth, it could be interdental, right? I don't make a T, by the way. This is not a good example for me. Watch my mouth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, it's a normal T. For eighth, I have no T at all. And I've asked many native speakers. Many of them don't say eighth. They say eighth. But he's assuming we have it. If we have it, then it's eighth. The T becomes interdental. All right, tenth is a better example. The N becomes interdental. Tenth, my N is interdental. Um, this T is more accurately called a voiceless dental stop, voiceless interdental. Let's make it interdental stop. And we'll have a special symbol for transcribing it. I'll tell you right now. Um, it looks like a tooth. So if a sound is dentalized, Okay? We use the dental symbol. So that's the symbol for a dental pronunciation. It's dentalized. In both British and American, the T in bitten is accompanied by a glottal stop. Bitten. Mm, bitten. And we have a special symbol for that right here. Glottal stop. Glottal stop, one of the purposes or one of the Ways a glottal stop is used in English is as an allophone of T, as in bitten. And for most Americans and many younger British speakers, the T in catty is not catty, it's, it's a tap, right? Short D that cannot be lengthened, catty. And by the way, many Brits have trouble with that. They think it's a real D. They'll say caddy. But these words contrast, even though they're very similar. But, oops, to carry. So, caddy, caddy, buyang, they're very similar. In speech, we can't tell the difference, but if you slow down, this is caddy, cannot be pronounced caddy, cannot be. But this one can't. That's the difference. One can be lengthened, the other can't. The other difference is this is a longer vowel. Caddy, caddy. So get Abby Jiao Chang, you this is voiced. Okay? Mm, what else do we have here? All of these are different sounds. All of these different sounds are part of the T phoneme. That's a Su Cheng or a, or a popularized way of saying, a simpler way of saying that they are what of this phoneme? And we call those what? Allophones. In Chinese, it's in. Just like in uh, chemistry, we have su. in. They have the same in way but they sound different. We have another useful word here, and that's phones. And in Chinese, phones are called what? 音值. 
The actual value of the sound. That means in speech how you actually say it is the yin zhi. That's the phone. Sometimes you will hear yin zhi used for allophones. 它实际的发音就是它的phone,就是音值。可是呢,我们就知道它是属于哪一个音位的时候, we'll say it's an allophone, for example, of t,同位音是t的同位音, okay? None of these variations is enough to change the meaning of a word. And that all these variations occur in citation speech, and are not simply the result of failing to hit the target when speaking clearly. So, 不只是说讲话讲得快,就不小心讲得有一点那个跟原来的target不一样。它实际上就是这么念的. So those are separate allophones of the same phoneme, in this case T, which has a lot of allophones. And we can use other symbols to represent different sounds in different contexts. So, L and R normally stand for voiced approximants, but in words like Ply and try. Ply means 运作 or, or to travel, like to ply the oceans. Um, the L becomes what? Normally, L is voiced, but here it becomes because of the P sound, which is voiceless. It becomes assimilated. And vowel sounds also vary. The E in heed is usually different from the E in heel. L's after a vowel really change the vowel. So in Mouin后面有 So listen. Heed, heel. Yi本来是很纯的母音, e, not like e. He. But heed, is it still pure? Heed. Is the vowel still pretty pure? You don't think so? Heed, heed, compared to heel. Which one sounds pure? Yeah, huh? Pure. 比较没有变化,一直维持一样的母音的那个值,那个性值. Heed, heed. You don't see my mouth moving, but watch. Heel, heel. There's a big change. So E is pure with the D at the end, not so pure with the L at the end. Okay, we'll get through it quickly. They're talking about the tap rule at the top. They're talking about how we mark dental sounds. I already showed you. I also gave you the symbol for the tap, which I don't like to call flap. Please call it tap. Um, for width, we can put a dental symbol because of the the sound. These extra symbols like this, which shows that a sound is dental, these are called, we've already had the word, what is it? Dia. Dia what? Everyone, diacritics. Diacritics. All of these extra symbols are called diacritics. We add them to show the small variations in pronunciation of a sound in context. And these variations are called allophones. We already covered that. And we also talked about the length mark. We're not going to go over that at the top of Bottom of 46 to 47, they're talking about the length mark. He used to use that in one of the editions. It caused a lot of confusion. I remember I was discussing it with a phonetician friend. Neither, neither of us liked it, so they got rid of it. But they didn't get rid of all of them. So you show you And then R, we are using the up, upside down R. We're using the upside down R. Some dictionaries don't get used to it, that's all. All right, we're in the middle of 47. Students sometimes also make the mistake of thinking that allophones are written with diacritics, while phonemes are written with simple phonetic symbols. Consider, though, the pronunciation of the word letter. For most people, most speakers of American English, there's no T in this, there's no T sound in this word at all. It's the. And so we use the tap symbol. So we will on the transcription with do yong tap. It's, there's no diacritic, it's a special symbol. The term broad transcription is often used to designate a transcription that uses the simplest possible set of symbols. Start paying attention, you've got words in bold, right? They're in the test, I can tell you right now. So if we want to use the simplest possible set of symbols, we're doing what kind of a transcription? Phonemic and broad. All right, it's phonemic. We don't want to show details. 
we just want to show distinctive sounds. If we want to show detail, we call it what kind of transcription? Narrow. narrow. I don't say narrow. There's nothing wrong with it. It's East Coast. Narrow and phonetic. It's a phonetic transcription. It's a more phon phonetic transcription. It's a narrow transcription. And he's showing you some examples of broad versus narrow transcription. Please read that yourself. So every transcription should be seen as having two aspects. One is often not explicit. There's the phonetic text itself, and at least implicitly, implicitly, there is a set of conventions for interpreting the text. So even if we write water like this, you know that if, you're, if you are transcribing the speech of an American, that T is almost always going to be a tap. We just apply the rule in our heads. We want to use, sometimes we want to use a very simple phonemic transcription. That means we have to apply the rules ourselves when you read it. We're not going to mark it. We're not going to say that's a tap, give you a special symbol. If it's a very broad phonemic transcription, we're not giving you the detail. You must know the rules and apply them yourself. OK? Mm. That's it. OK, we're on the last page of the chapter, and the bell's going to ring in two minutes. This will also be in the test, anything in bold, remember. On a few occasions, a transcription cannot be said to imply the existence of rules accounting for allophones. Sometimes we don't know the rules for allophones. Like in this word, maybe you've never seen the, you've never seen the word in written form before. And I say, I need a drink of water. I need some water. If you have never studied English, will you automatically know that that really is a T? When you hear water, if you haven't learned English before. So all you can do is write down the tap and say, maybe this, is, maybe this belongs to a different phoneme, or maybe it's a phoneme by itself. Like better, water. You don't know. If it's a new language to you, you don't know. In that situation, all we can do is write down the phonetic sound. 还没有归纳出它属于哪一个phoneme的情况之下, we have a name for that kind of transcription, which is, everyone? Systematic phonetic transcription. Please memorize it and practice writing it, because some of you forget how to spell it, or you forget the words and you write something similar but totally wrong. So please, anything in bold, practice writing it and memorize it. And it says, in practice, it's hard to make a transcription so narrow that it shows all the details. There is no end to the amount of detail you can put into a transcription. This is a mewa meliao de shiching. You have to say basta at some point. What does basta mean? Spanish studiers? Who's it? The Spanish learners? Basta means gola. So at some point, you say, I'm not going to put any more detail. No detail tai shila, wo biao zila. So at some point, you just have to say no more detail. It's too much. It ex it's exhausting. Putting down a lot of phonetic detail is exhausting. You only do it if you have a very good reason to do it. And sometimes a transcription may not imply the existence of rules accounting for allophones because in the circumstances, nothing was known about the rules. And that's an impressic, uh, impressionistic transcription. Mm. So what's the difference between the two? A transcription that shows the allophones. Actually, systematic phonetic transcription. It's like implied you already know the, the allophonic rules. So if you already know the allophonic rules, then it's systematic, a systematic phonetic transcription. Then it's just an impressionistic transcription. We don't know the rules. Finally, we hope this brief survey of different kinds of transcription makes plain that there is no such thing as the IPA transcription of a particular utterance. Sometimes, one wants to make a detailed phonetic transcription. Other times, it is more convenient to make a... Actually, I stressed the wrong word, not wants. One wants to make a detailed phonetic transcription. At other times, it is more convenient to make a...
phonemic transcription. Sometimes one wants to point out a particular phonetic feature, such as vowel length. Other times, we don't care about the vowels. We've got five vowels, they're very clear, never mind the vowels. They don't have a lengthened and a shortened version, or we don't care about it. In that case, um, we may want to put in some details of the consonants. So, IPA transcriptions take many forms. As I've said before, transcription implies choices, decisions. Always when you make a transcription, you have to make some decisions and some choices. There is no absolute correct form. It depends on your purpose. We finished the chapter. <laughs> I had to push it along, and that's what happens when we want to hurry. I start summarizing, and you don't get as much chance. But at some point, I had to say basta. We had to finish the chapter. So next time, which is next Monday, what do we have to do? We'll do the performance exercises in class, and we're going to mark the exercises. And if you look at letter J, okay, that's just do what it says, basically. Yeah, that's not a problem. There was something I wanted to tell you about. Hang on. We're not going to go into the detail for, for E under the performance exercises. We're only going to read the things that he provides there. We just don't have the time. We may start doing it another time in the semester. We may try to do transcriptions of an unfamiliar language. That will take more time. So right now, we just need to get to chapter 3. So next time, performance exercises, written exercises, and make sure that you've read the web pages that I've told you. In this test, I am also going to test you on the content of the web pages. All the web pages that we have covered so far, except for writing Chinese uh, IPA, IPA uh, writing, writing um, a transcription of Chinese and IPA. But everything else I will. Pinyin, Kat Kwat, and especially the three tutorials. Those are all within the fan way of the test. OK? Questions? Anybody have a question? Okay, we finished almost on time. <laughs> we'll see you Monday. And maybe on Facebook. <laughs>